From UBN Studios, you're listening to Unsugarcoated with Alia, bringing you interviews with public figures and inspirational people, speaking on self-improvement with empowering themes. And I'm your host, Alia Lanius. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to your favorite social good podcast. I am your host, Ali Alanius, and I am so excited to be here again with you. We are continuing our theme. And if you haven't gotten it by now, it's trust the process, right? Trust the process in what you are doing, what you are trying to accomplish. And on those days that you just don't know if you can keep going, rely on these things that we've been talking about throughout the podcast to keep you moving forward. Um, We've talked so far about knowing the value that you bring. We've discussed visualizing your success. And today we're going to be talking a bit about using what you learn during each step of the process, uh, or as I like to call, even failing forward. Um, Life is definitely about strategy and flow, if you're not aware. And for me, you know, I set a goal, I determine my approach, but I stay in a state of flow because I know that I know that I know (laughs) that things do not ever go as planned, right? (laughs) They don't often go, you, there's always a hiccup, there's always something that happens. And being in a state of flow means that you do not get caught up in what's happening, but you can stay determined, stay flexible, and in the process, learn so that you can grow. I've learned many things from different parts of my life. I learned to also divorce myself from the idea that what I'm going to try and accomplish is happening 100% the way that I anticipate. Uh, And like I said a second ago, in fact, I anticipate for things to go wrong. And then this helps me be better prepared when they do. Our journeys are just not linear and setbacks are a part of life. So how do we come back from that? And how do we push forward so that we can continue to succeed? And you know, this is in that same vein, I've got to say that in order to succeed, you really just first have to try. Uh, Too many people out there are afraid of failure. And I encourage you to understand that failure, and I put quotes, is nothing other than an experience that teaches us how to fail forward, how to recover. How beautiful are you? How resilient are you? How courageous are you for actually going through the things that you do? And when you take what you've learned and you grow with it, once you see that, again, you realize there is no such thing as failing, only trying. And I need you out there in the world, wherever you are, to never ever be ashamed of that. Because I know people try to make you feel ashamed of pursuing your dreams. With that, I'm going to bring into a part of the conversation something that's a little bit sad. Um, We had an amazing guest before, Jill Gurr, on episode 36, on the front lines with at-risk youth is the name of the episode. Jill Gurr is the founder. She is a person who believed in people from what I knew. That was one of the things that stood out to me about her and why I had her on this show to talk about her organization, her amazing, incredible history, even as a film in film, and how that caused her, that journey caused her to have an experience where she said, I want to give back to at-risk youth and people in underserved communities. And she created this incredible program that has impacted thousands and thousands of children across Southern California. Um, I got to tell you, because of her, I have had the experience to be part of that. I just recently, we just recently finished a, 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 a program that I, we collaborated on in a school in South LA where it was called Inspiration to Publication. And we had these amazing books that these young kids, we did a 10 weeks with them. And then they did these articles, poems, written projects. And then we published a book for them and we held a party and each of these kids got to hold a book that they had put their heart and effort into and and see how that feels. That is part of what (laughs) Jill Gurr created. And I'm very thankful that even during the pandemic, I remember when, you know, everything was going kind of crazy for a lot of people. A lot of people were very anxious. A lot of people were very worried. And me, you know, the Gen Xer and the like survivor (laughs) that I am, I was like, no, 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 let's get on IG. Let's start creating empowering conversations. I can't get to the studio because everything was going crazy. But I knew that there was a way to still do something and a way to create impact. And I remember when I reached out to Jill and I said, would you please have a conversation with me on IG? She said, sure. 
tell me when to be there and tell me how I can help. That was the type of woman. <laughs> and I keep getting emotional when I say it, but it's because it's very true. That is the reality. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about life and death. It's not just about the impact that you make during your life. It is also mostly about the impact we leave behind. So I'm not trying to be emotional and mushy on you guys, I promise. But look, she's a beautiful person and we know that energy cannot be destroyed, only transferred. So I'm here today to have a conversation about learning, um, you know, as we go and as we trust through the process to a very incredible man who she had recently appointed to be the CEO of Create Now just prior to her unexpected passing. And so with that, we will get into his introduction. Brandon Jean Johnson serves as CEO of Create Now, a nonprofit organization that empowers at-risk and high-risk youth and young adults from ages 3 to 24. Brandon and Create Now offer a variety of arts programs in multiple disciplines that help these youth to not only heal, but also to thrive. He studied graphic design and fine arts at Elizabeth City State University in North Carolina. Brandon lived throughout Europe where he taught visual art programs to children and kids. And he worked for Zachary Levi Nerds HQ as the art director and production coordinator. Brandon was later hired by Pure Imagination Studios where he worked with top entertainment companies. And as a creative as well, he founded Big Footers, a production company that produces high quality content. Here to discuss his new role and the journey that he takes on, the legacy he carries on, and everything about what he his own experience. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Brandon Dean Johnson. How's it going? How's it going, Brandon? How are you? Well, we just saw each other recently, yeah. like last week. Well, Got to stop yeah. running into each other like this, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Actually, it was from, I'm like, hey, I really need to have you come on. One, you know, Jill Gurr and, and everything that she's created was incredible. I don't have to tell you this. And mm -hmm. I obviously want you to share with our audience in a second how, how that even transpired and how you even came to know Joker, but you know, thank you for being here today and thank you for even allowing me an opportunity to continue working with youth, especially, you know, through Create Now, I not only worked with the youth, I did the program with young women in transitional housing with small children. So, I mean, listen, first of all, welcome. And how did you originally become connected to Create Now's Jill, founder, Jill Gurr? Yeah, first off, thank you for having me on the show. I'm excited to be here. Um, and yeah, we got to stop running to each other like this. <laughs> uh, but to answer your question, I, I've known Jill for seven plus years now. And um, we met when I first moved to L.A. You know, I was struggling, trying to look for a creative outlet for myself. And I knew I wanted to give back to the community. So I was on Google one day and I, looking around for nonprofits profits to uh, volunteer with. And I found like five nonprofits. And I was like, OK, cool. Let me reach out to them and see if I can volunteer. So out of those five, four of them said no. I'm like, why? Why no? You know, I'm giving you free time, you know, coming here with free services. And they're like, no, we, you don't have enough, enough experience to volunteer, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, come on. So um, I found uh, Create Now was the fifth one. And I reached out to, you know, the info at createnow.com. And Jill replied and was like, hey, can you come in for a meeting? I'm like, yeah, sure. She's like, can you come in this weekend? So I was like, yeah, let's do it. So um, went downtown. Me and Jill sat for hours talking about what she started and, you know, what the nonprofit is. And it just aligned perfectly with what my life and, you know, my, my things that I've done in the art community. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. And uh, from there, we've just been climbing up and up. And now I'm here in this position. How how did it come to be the conversation when she said, hey, I have built this you know, incredible organization as we, you know, she's impacted tens of thousands of children. How did it come to be where she says, you know, I'm going to pass the reins to you and, and ask you, what was that conversation like? Yeah. Uh, whew, that's, that was a, a big one because, you know, Create Now was so near and dear to her. It was like a child. So, you know, it's not easy for somebody to say, hey, it's time for me to, to pass it on. Um, but that was a, a conversation that lasted for uh, a year plus. Uh, okay. Over the years, I'd be, you know, started off as a, a a volunteer cleaning up the, you know, the buildings and stuff downtown. And then from there, went to a mentor, from mentor to board member, board member, board chair. So when I became board chair, you know, things became a little bit more serious. And, you know, the board started talking about it. Jill started talking about it. And just over the last year, we just came to a conclusion like, hey, 
Jill wants to, you know, take the path of writing and, you know, doing what she did before Create Now. Uh, because this position is a lot, you know, and she was up there. Um, so, you know, we, we, we came up, you know, with the decision together, like, hey, let's do this. And, you know, it was a little struggle at first, you know, just passing it over. But um, in the end, you know, it was smooth. And uh, it was sad to just see her go like that. Right, right. It was know? quite unexpected. Mm -hmm. How was it for you the day that you found out? Yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure if you know how Jill is, but Jill's the type of person, like, if you text her, she's going to text you right back. Right. If you call her, she's going to pick up on the first ring. Um, and that didn't happen uh, when I, I tried to get in contact with her. She was still working with us. You know, she was our grant writer. Um, so, you know, it was, um, I think it was Martin Luther King weekend. Uh, I texted her that Thursday saying, you know, hey, have a good weekend. I'll talk to you on Monday after the break and no reply. So I'm like, Ooh, OK, whatever. So so um, you know, as the weekend went on, I didn't think anything, anything of it. But then this random person and it, it kind of freaked me out a little bit um, from India text me. He was like, hey, have you talked to Jill? I'm like, no. Why, why, what's wrong? He was like, hey, I've been in contact with her for weeks and I just texted her. She didn't text back. And I heard that she died. So it first came from an e uh, you know, email, and I thought it was spam. I was like, there's no way. No way. So Monday came, calling, calling, nothing, texting, texting, nothing. So I was like, let me just go down to her to her apartment to see you know, where she is. And I went down there, and um, I saw her car in the driveway. So I went up to her apartment, and her, her front door was open, but the screen was there blocking you know, the entrance. And um, I saw the lights on. So I'm like, okay, cool. Somebody's here. So knocked on the door, and this lady that looked identical to Jill, Jill's sister, answered. And that was when she told me, like, hey, Jill passed away mm -hmm. oh, uh, last Thursday. So it was, uh, it was rough, you know. Um, I wasn't expecting it at all. Right. And, uh, yeah, it was big. Well, and in, in that process, you know, you're, you're managing your emotions because mm -hmm. this is somebody you've worked with who gave you a chance and, and has brought you into. And by the way, I love that about Create Now because they really do open up to creatives who want to give back. That is exactly how she mm -hmm. <laughs> said, I want to help. And she, they, they love for people who want to help them because they need, right? There's just not enough resources yeah. ever when it comes to um, philanthropy work. And so now you have to take everything that she's taught you in a short amount of time and carry forward for this vision. How does the weight of that legacy feel? Oh, it's a lot. Uh, because, you know, me, me and Jill, we were same in certain areas, but different in other areas. Her, her strong point was really writing. You know, that's, that's her background, a writer. For me, I'm, I'm more of a producer, director, a creator. So what she brought to the nonprofit is something I'm not that good at writing grants, finding them, all that so right now like you know when she passed we still have work coming in mm -hmm. you know still things that she was applying for that just you know fell on my lap and I'm like oh no I, I've never written a grant before like how do I move forward from here so right now just finding people that can help me in that area for me to keep doing what I'm good at right. and, and outreaching you know marketing I'm good at marketing but right now it's a lot of balancing things around and it just sucks because everything happened all at once. Right. You know. Right. Um, but over time, you know, we'll get back on track and we'll we'll continue to grow. It's definitely trusting the process, you, right? You got to do it. Um, people often think that crisis creates culture, but I'm actually well aware that's not the truth. It's actually <laughs> quite the opposite. If anything, crisis exposes your culture. <laughs> Can you speak to the foundational culture created by Jill? And how it has actually allowed Create Now to navigate the pandemic. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what she created was so beautiful, um, a little bit ahead of, ahead of its time. And just it's crazy to see, like, what type of vision she really had, um, because, you know, we talked about even things that she wanted to happen uh, after I became CEO and the expansion that, you know, needs to happen. And even now, like me thinking about, it, I'm like, ooh, that, that's that's a pretty big ask. Um, but I, I've I've seen create now help thousands of kids. You know, yes. over the years, I've, I've been a part of it. I've seen I've seen kids, um, you know, take what we teach them and want to go to the next level with you know college, um, or not even college, but you know, be, get a job. Right. You know, get get out of the communities that they're in because a lot of the community. Um, 
you know, they're it's it's, it's bad. Um, especially like most of the kids we serve are in Watts, mm-hmm. Imperial Courts area, and that area over there, no kids should have to be involved with that. But um, what Jill started, it I, I think it just started a conversation years ago. I mean, we've been around for twenty five years. So what she started, I think, has really helped a lot of conversations. You know, start, but uh, we need to get a lot bigger. So, um, yeah, I mean, as long as we're helping one kid, you know, that's going through something, I think that's what, what the most important thing is. Right. We're definitely doing that right now. Yeah, it's interesting because, I, I mean, please, you, we don't, I don't want to reiterate all of Jill's episode. <laughs> I want audience, if you haven't watched it, go back and watch it because her, how it inspired her and her start and all of the, you know, as you mentioned, she was a screenwriter and she had this young kid who she met at three o'clock in the morning when she was doing what, mm-hmm. don't, don't be a, or don't yeah. be a society um, film and she, so is there a particular child, is there a particular story that stands out to you? Um, I have multiple. Uh <laughs> Because, like, you know, I started as a volunteer, so, like, I really saw – I've seen Create Now both ways, you know, inside out, as a volunteer, as an outsider, as a board member. So, like, every crevice I've been a part of. And there's multiple stories that I could tell you about kids that I've come in contact with, um, good and bad. I mean, the good the good story is, you know, that kid that told me that she wanted to go to college after our eight-week class. Uh, she was a senior. And at the be- beginning of the class, you know, she's looking at me like, I can't do this. I can't draw on a computer. And by the end, end, end of the, you know, the semester or the classes, um, she had a, por- a portfolio that was amazing and told me, like, hey, Brandon, like, I want to take this to the next level and go to college. Um, so, that you know, that's a success story that, I, that always sticks with me. But even the bad ones, like, um, in Watts, it's a bad community. Uh, and there was a girl young girl you know she was probably like around nine uh we would have these events and she would always come to me you know always you know and i remembered her name so you know remembering a kid's name you know really means a lot to them so i remember the first time i told her like hey i remember you from last time and i said her name and she was like wow you remember me so you know we we kind of we kind of bonded so every time she saw me she would come up and hug me and you know if i had something for her i would give it to her and the rest of the girls in her, her group would do the same thing but um over the pandemic i found out now, you know, years later, she was probably like 13, 12, 13, that she got caught up in uh, sex trafficking. Mm. And, I mean, that's that's a, a huge thing that's, that's happening that people don't understand. Right. And they start young, real mm-hmm. young, and we can't, we can't even find her, you know. So even though we try our best with Crate now, it doesn't mean that every kid that we, we get in our grasp, they're going to stay. Right. You know, because they still have to go back home. And they have to deal with whatever is in their community. Right, mm-hmm. right. And especially in these challenged communities, it's not it's not always the, um, you know, the ease, so easy of like, well, just just stick through it. It'll all get better. I mean, there are real challenges mm-hmm. in communities that they have to deal with. And it's not as easy as it seems. Um, and but, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people will say, well, you you don't fix all the problems. So what's the point? Like you said, that's not that's not the point. The yeah. point is you you help the ones that you can mm-hmm. and you you create that impact. I find that when I work with kids, which is why I love volunteer. I remember when I was 18, even though my life was a mess, I was volunteering at the Cate or, or orphanages in Mexico. I'd go down and spend a day. And I always found it to this day. I find I'm more impacted mm. when I help others. Mm-hmm. Um, how you know aside from these like how do you find it's the same thing that these kids give you more than sometimes you're giving them uh i mean i feel like it's a, it's a good circle for both of us like they're getting something i'm getting something um i remember my first class it was a mural workshop out in north hollywood and i'm going again like i've never done a mural with 20 plus kids before you know um i've never even done a mural this big but i'm learning while i'm teaching you know, it's pretty funny because a lot of people, they learn while they teach. And what I know is far more than what these kids know at this age. Mm-hmm. You know, so what if I t- can teach them the basics, which I do know, they're learning as well. So um, that was like, you know, it, it, you know, I give and I get it at the same time. Right. So it's, it's, it's like Christmas. It from- is. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about the belief system that there is no failing, only trying? I do believe in that. Uh, it's funny because I posted something on Facebook. I don't even post things on Facebook, but I posted you know, my story. And I said something along the lines of, you know, no matter how successful you get in life, you will still fail at something. 
Um, and that's me, you know. I, I even though you know I'm still I'm a CEO now, and people are like, "Oh, you're a CEO." I'm still failing, you know. I still fail at a lot of stuff. Um, but it's just all about how I tackle it and go about it um, that makes me different than other from other people. You know, right. A lot of people would just sit down and be like, "Oh, I can't do it. I can't do it." But for me, I'm like, it's a challenge. I, let me let me keep going at it. That I de- that I mean, that's definitely somebody who's focused on the solution as opposed to the problem, mm-hmm. right? Which is exactly why, like yeah. learning, taking what you said, like you, and I love what you said, the teachers often learn themselves. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it's actually one of the reasons why I love teaching because it forces me, even when I'm writing, mm-hmm. like it forces me to go research and learn and mm-hmm. dive into stuff and, and look at things from different perspectives. So, I mean, you know, and I think that ultimately when you're dealing with at-risk youth and, and at-risk individuals, period, who have gone through a lot of trauma, as you said, they're... There is such a concept in society around if you try and then you don't make it. See, I told you so. Exactly. You know, how do you, how do how do through the arts do you feel that these empower these at-risk individuals and youth to to develop that belief system that pushes them forward when they when they do hit the problems? Yeah. I mean, and even with their class, you know, a lot of the kids that you're teaching, they're at the beginning they're like we can't do this. Like, you know, how 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 um but, you know, as long as somebody is there telling them, like, hey, you can do this, keep going, it's go- it, with the arts, it's really on them to keep going outside of the, the classroom. You know, arts isn't just in the – it shouldn't be in the classroom. It should be right. what you develop outside of class. So if we're telling them, like, in the class, like, hey, you can do this, hopefully they'll go home and grab a piece of paper and start writing on their own or, you know, start painting on their own. But with that belief or that knowledge that, you know, somebody like ourselves are supporting them. By saying, hey, what you're doing right now is good. And all, all you can do is get better. Do you feel that through the arts there's um, also healing? I find that when I talk about, you know, journaling and creativity, mm-hmm. it's an outlet, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, 100%. So, And I mean, I agree with you. The kids at the end were like, I'm so, now I feel like I really can do it. And, and I mean, I love that. And sometimes it was interesting because then you see, I remember that <laughs> there's just be like one kid was like, I wasn't happy with my outcome. And I'm like, it's probably because you felt you didn't put enough into it. However, that's OK because you can do better next time. This yeah. isn't the end all be all. Yeah. And you still have a taste of what you're capable of. So, you know, what what else? Like, we, you know, people always say glass ceilings. I don't actually like glass ceilings. I'm like, there's no ceiling, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Not, I don't. Um, what goes into creating these programs uh, for these individuals? And how do you really look to create an impact? Like ensure that you're yeah. creating the impact? Yeah. Well, the number one thing is money. So donations, that's the number one thing. Uh, that's the only way we can keep going. Yeah, you know? I, well, I want to elaborate that because what you guys do with the money is you provide the journals for the kids and you provide and, you know, the, the resources. And mm-hmm. then they feel so good when they're like, oh, I, you give me this book or mm-hmm. oh, you're giving me a backpack and yeah. I can actually like a sketch pad. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, my goodness. Right. So, yeah. yeah so anyway, so I I'll, mean, ta- I'll talk to you more about the book. Remind me about that in a second. But <laughs> no, number one is financials because we can't we can't do anything right. without money. Um and, you know, you even look at the school systems and the first thing to go are the arts. Right. And like you were asking earlier about how therapeutic it is. The arts are very therapeutic. Like for myself as a kid, like I was going through a lot mentally, you know, so my only escape was in the arts. So now, like, I'm able to live what I love, you know, in the arts and also now give back to you. So 100 um, percent therapeutic. But um the other question was how do how what do we need to keep going is you know just a good team you know we we have lola laura who Mm -hmm, you were working mm -hmm. with uh we just hired a new grant uh, manager um and these are people that are going to help us continue to grow we can't we and we're only a team of three and that's that's small for a nonprofit that's been around for 25 years that serve over fifty thousand kids within la county uh we need more so we we need um, you know, L.A. to talk, start talking more about us. Right. Um, and starting the conversation. In, and in fact, it's, uh, you know, when we talk about there's the regular, I say regular, like the normal or uh, already existing challenges that um, especially it's looking at youth. 
mm-hmm. you know, um, because I know you guys serve adults as well. And I mean, and even in uh, in the program I was with the older women, you know, it's like taking writing and showing them how to use it to get a job, how to go get a write a resume. How do you apply for college? If you've got a, if you have, you know, you now you're on your own, you want to take care of your child. How do you create the life that you're trying to live in? Writing mm-hmm. is a very big piece of that. And so, um, but, you know, kind of going back to the youth, we're, we're just obviously coming off this still dealing with a pandemic right and i kind of want to talk about how i um the um oh my gosh why did i lose i took out what i used it was unicef unicef okay. mm-hmm. sorry pardon me audience i usually have it all together you guys know better and then sometimes i don't but that's okay you guys still <laughs> love me <laughs> um but on on a serious note uh the the pandemic has greatly exasperated issues for children in low-income neighborhoods. I mean, the disparity. So I'm just going to say this. In 2022, according to UNICEF and forward, actually in 22 and forward, 2022 and moving forward, the global community needs to tr- to recast its COVID-19 strategy to focus not only on mitigating the virus, but mitigating its effect on society, particularly children. Disparities drove an early and rapid recovery in rich countries and neighborhoods, while in developing countries and lower income um, neighborhoods and countries, especially the poorest, have continued to languish. The scenario described paints a bleak outlook for children, especially the most vulnerable, which you guys deal with. What do you think can be done to improve children's futures right now? Oh, man. I mean, just to tell you the truth, within our generations, we can only do so much. So at least starting the conversation now so the next generation won't have to deal with it. Uh, Planting seeds, that's what we need to start doing. Because, again, like I said earlier, we can't get every kid. Right. You know, we don't we don't have the resources. We don't have the time. So at least planting those seeds to keep growing. So over time, you know, we will, you know, have harmony. Right. Um, so I, I understand like, hey, don't don't try to do the most you can. But understand, like, you cannot go past a certain level. Sure. You know? um, so that's all we can do right now is just, you know, these kids that we're serving, like, like hopefully they will be in our positions in the future right. where they're still continuing the conversations and, you know, other kids around them doing the right. same thing. Which is why you said it's so important to plant those seeds. Uh, programs like Create Now and others, which, like you said, and they always take the funding from the arts now <laughs> first. I do not understand. Mm-hmm. But they are truly able to help mitigate some of the horrible effects of COVID that we know. And, you know, I want to say, how hard is it to actually get the funding and support you need? Do you guys feel like it is, um, you know, it's hard. a challenge to ask people support? these kids it's not a, it's not a challenge to ask sure. it's a challenge of getting, getting right. uh and we're it's funny because you know we're a nonprofit in competition with other nonprofits. right so like applying for a grant like we're going up against other people and it's like why are we fighting for funds that we know are there right why not we just spread it across yeah um so and it's also funny like you know these companies like they want something out of giving right they're just not giving Right. They they want oh so it, you be, you end up working for them at a point. It's like mm-hmm. come on, you guys just can't you know support us. Right. No, I understand like they want to spread the word and tell people that they're doing good, but it's like just do good. Right. There's right. no reason to to talk about it. Yeah. And I, I mean, think companies yeah. need to definitely understand, especially as part of this process, because it matters. You know, it does mean investing in restoring losses from the pandemic all the way across in learning in the health programs, in nutrition, in children's mental health. Mm -hmm. Like we have such an increase in suicide rates. We have an increase in drug use. We have an increase in sexual abuse, Mm -hmm. sex crimes against our youth. It's, and and I'm just gonna speak, I I know that not everyone in the world is dealing with all LA right now, but on top of it, we have an increase in crime. We have a a devastated economic, For you know, there's a saying out there, we're all in, I was just talking about this, you know, we're all in the same boat, you know, mm-hmm. and I and I love the response. No, we're not. Some of us are in yachts. <laughs> some of us are in rowboats and some of us are drowning. Mm-hmm. We're in the same storm. We are not in the same, same boat. boat mm-hmm. Right. So and when it comes to mental health and the ironic part to that is there are people in the yachts that are still struggling from mental health. Mm-hmm. So how how can we support the children and their mental health. I mean, we, I, you know, I'm, I'm saying this out loud, but of course it is to the investing. And and 
to the companies out there that are looking for like the 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 shiny blingy objects that make it worth it like again i would just say to that person it really is the experience of knowing you've made a difference in yeah. someone's life mm -hmm. do you always have to see the impact you make to know that you made one no right? it, 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 an impact can happen 20 years from you know where you actually made the impact mm. so um no i mean even looking at what jill started she started this thing 25 years ago and it's still making an impact now and she's not seeing that you know she hope you know up, up and above she might be but uh no i mean the struggle with just what we do is crazy you would think everybody would just want to come out and help but you know we run into a lot of issues um and there's like a barrier barrier that we're trying to break and it's it's like really hard right but you know I, I, like you said uh you know failure you know that's what that's what you do you fail so right now like i'm going out and talking to as many people as possible and all, all i can accept is a yes or a no at right. this point so if i if it's a no then okay perfect but if it's a yes then we grow from there right uh, usually when i hear no it's interesting and i'm just curious your thought on this it, you know if you have a similar process but usually when i hear no sometimes it's it, it's not that they shouldn't be saying no but often and i'm only saying this for other people that go through the process i'll stop to say well why no Right. Why is it no? Is it too much money? Mm -hmm. Do you not have it? Mm -hmm. Did I say something wrong? Mm -hmm. Did I not appeal to you the way that you needed to be appealed to? Because what was it that caused the no? Because I feel like, again, when we talk about trusting the process and then learning from the no's, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. What do you learn from no's in your life? Well, I mean, when you're talking to people, it's kind of one of my first jobs was like a, at a telemarketer uh, location and you have a script. And in that script, they give you ways out of when people say no. You know, they give, they, they, okay, if this person says no here, you know, it's too much money. Okay, cool. Well, when do you think that you will get to this point where you would have the funds to be able to donate? You know, and if they, if they go, oh, probably never. Okay. Well, then that might be the end of the conversation. Um, but when it comes to nonprofit work, like myself right now, people might say, no, we might not have the money. Okay, cool. Well, do you have the time to donate or time to volunteer? Oh, okay. No, I don't have the time to volunteer. Okay. Well, do you have time to at least share our our message to right. people? Um, and if a person says no at that point, then it's like, okay, cool. Right. I, I got to keep going. But you, you give people options on what they can do whenever they say no. Right. You just keep it pushing from there. Yeah. And you bring up a very good point. It is absolutely free to promote another business or organization. Social digital currency is a thing. Mm -hmm. And going to the Create Now IG page and sharing it and your stories, yeah. sharing a post, look at what these amazing people are doing. If you don't know it for yourself, find it out because those are ways to actually help. I know that a lot of people, they wanna hear from somebody else. Oh, I really trust this organization, right? Because you know there is also this, this wicked part, like I'm a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. And I cannot tell you how many times it hurts when somebody is out there, they have a GoFundMe page, or they are raising money for a cancer diagnosis they do not have. Mm -hmm. They, you know, it, oh my God, those stories always come back and haunt our community because it's like, great, now you just, you know, made yeah. us. Now nobody wants to give to our organizations because you're not, you're corrupt, mm -hmm. because you're corrupt. Mm -hmm. And so there's that, I feel, that nonprofits, you know, how do you go about challenging that stigma of, yeah. you know, well, how do we know what, we're do what you're doing with the money? Yeah. I mean, what this is I'm, I'm nine months in right now. So right now, like I'm, I'm building that trust just based off of, you know, my freshness and, and, and showing people like, hey, in the past, I've done all this great stuff, you know, working in the entertainment industry, doing this. This is my background and this is what I'm bringing to create now. So right now, like all I can do is continue to be myself. And hopefully people will gravitate to that because people have always gravitated to me saying I'm a nice person. So hopefully I can bring that to the to create now. And we've never done anything corrupt that I know that right. I've known of, hopefully. You know? Right. No. Um, but um, but yeah, all, all I can do is be myself as the CEO and just get more people to come in. Right. Um, and can I say tell a story about that real quick? Absolutely. Please. do. All right. So uh, back in December, uh, it was about seven o'clock at night and I got a phone call at seven o'clock and it was you know this 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 little lady o older lady calling saying hey i want to make a donation to your nonprofit." so you know at this point i'm like oh man it's after hours why am i taking this phone call but you know in my mind i'm like hey you're a ceo now this is what we have to do so i'm like hey okay yeah if you want to make a donation you can go to our website 
and you know plugging your information and blah 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 she's like oh well i, I want to donate about ten thousand dollars so at that point i'm like okay um like i should probably really take yeah <laughs> well let, let, let's uh well how do you want to do you want to mail it in do you want to meet she's like let's have a meeting so i'm like okay cool let's have a meeting um then you know later on in the conversation she's like okay you come to my house this saturday so in my mind i'm like okay i'm going to a random person's house on saturday and blah. okay cool um then she goes on and, and says my husband is a founding member of earth wind and fire so i'm like okay wow i know i know them and she's like yeah his name is verdine white i'm like okay wow okay well we can definitely have a meeting so um right after that phone call called my grandmother i'm like grandma guess what i just talked to um but i went to their house that saturday you know on my own time you know it's not even great now's time and talking to them we had a meeting sat there and talked for two hours and after the meeting uh miss shelley i call her aunt shelley now she gave me a check and she's like take this with you and the check was in an envelope. So I said, okay, perfect. I gave her a hug and I left and I didn't open the envelope at all. Halfway to my house, she um, she texted me. She's like, hey, can you send me a picture of the check? So I'm like, oh no, something must be wrong. Right. So I open the check and I look at the check and it says for $20,000. So I'm like, uh-oh, that's not right. So you know, I text her immediately. I'm like, hey, you gave me 10000 more than what you had said you were going to give us. She's like, no, I gave that to you because you're a good person. Mm. And I can tell you know, from, you know, the two hours that we spent together. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. You know, just based off of a conversation and, and getting to know somebody, they gave me more money than what they promised. Um, and that's what I hope to bring uh, to Create Now is just, you know, myself. And right. to keep that going. And Jill clearly had a lot of faith in you. I have to say this because we do get unsugarcoated on this podcast. Jill did this and she and she had challenges as we talk about and she was a white woman mm -hmm. did you guys have a conversation about what that would be like <laughs> handing this now to a black man yeah uh yeah of course you know she was a you know a five foot three <laughs> uh, jewish woman and i was you know six foot eight black i know male. he's six foot eight <laughs> okay audience i just found out his actual height mm. <laughs> yes anyways, sorry. but no we, we we talked about you know race and, and the divisions that come with racism um and not not just that, but with her struggles being a, a woman um, in in this industry, and you know I'm I've been black all my life, you know, so I, I know the struggles out there. I've, I've I've traveled internationally and I've seen some of the nastiest stuff you can imagine. So I'm down for a challenge, you know, as long as I'm helping people that look like me, uh, I, I can be a hero to them. So you know I'll put myself out there. Yeah. Um, I can take a blow. That's what we need, more heroes. Yeah, and, I'm going to be it. Yeah, I like, well, you already are it. You know, I'm you trying. already are. No, but I, I respect that and I understand that. And I think it's very important for people that look like us mm -hmm. to have somebody to look up and say, you know, if they did it, I can do it. Yeah. And and everyone has their origin story, right? What's part of your origin story that you can share with do, us? Do we have time for that? I know. Ooh, no, gee, I mean, like, don't whiz. do the whole when Ooh. I was five years old. <laughs> you know, a little bit. <laughs> So my mom and my dad, you know, came and made me. <laughs> um, but no, you know, um, I come from a, a a family, you know, not the original household of your mom, and your dad being there. You know, they were broken up um, and, you know, has stepmother, grandparents, you know, everybody cared for me. So I was like always bouncing around a little bit. And it in my mind, I thought that was normal. But then going to school and seeing like, oh, wow, this kid has his mom and dad there, and you know, like started to realize like hey whoa this isn't right you know so I, you were talking about how therapeutic the arts was there was a point in my in my life where i was like i'm not right there's something wrong you know so combined with art and therapy that's what really helped me understand like oh you know this is the life that i was given and i have to go about it a certain way not everybody's the same right so uh that's basically my origin story and from there like the arts have been a part of my life ever since i was five years old you know sitting down in my grandma's living room watching looney tunes and sitting there like wow how did they make bugs bunny do this right i want to do this when i get older right and as time went on you know i i struggled people said no all the time you know coming from a from i'm from north carolina so coming from a, a, a small country town where no one knows anything about the arts mm -hmm. yet alone animation I'm not getting any any knowledge about what I want to do with my career. Mm. So I had to leave from out of my small city to go other places 
and just start collecting all the information I can, networking, coming back home, and still realizing, like, hey, home is not where I need to be. Right. So let me move to L.A. So um, moved out here, was homeless for about a week and a half, and then from there just started working up the ladder. Right. Um, and yeah. And here you are. I love, And you've learned. Mm-hmm. You've learned. And you came out here and you trusted. You bet on yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because when you talked about even what you had access to, I mean, I, I lived in Palos Verdes Estates for a little bit here with a couple of my kids. And it was actually very interesting to see what kids had access to. I mean, my daughter was in the fifth grade learning um, uh, AutoCAD engineering, basically. Mm-hmm. She was learning robotics. She, mm-hmm. My son was working on a th- 3D printer. And they had all these these things that when we moved to View Park, you know, I, I couldn't put them in the local school there because I knew that they weren't going to have that type of... And View Park's a beautiful neighborhood, ironically. Yeah. It is a beautiful neighborhood. But, of course, the way that L.A. is, and you can be... That's all over. By the way, West L.A., you can be in some really nice neighborhoods, and then you look at the school, and it's a two or a three. That's just real talk. But even more so in, in your more challenge, in your, you know, in, in South L.A., for mm-hmm. sure. Um so when you talk about it, it just reminds me of how much that that access and they do have to have. That's why you coming into the schools and you going into these communities, it provides them the mm-hmm. opportunity without having to go anywhere else necessarily when they still kind of can't. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, so and you love production. I love production. I love mm-hmm. producing. I love bringing things together. I love being a conduit. You know all those parts. We, let's talk a little bit very quickly because you are, you know, yes, you're doing nonprofit philanthropy. You also did found Big Footers, a production company, and you focus on producing high quality content. Do you mm-hmm. have you been able to use that and infuse that with also what you're doing with Create Now? Hundred percent. So it's funny because the program, the writing program that you started, well, not started, but the one that you did with the kids, right. I was the first person to ever make a book for Create Now. So with that, with me making the book, it gave, you know, Laura the vision like, hey, we can do this more often where we actually print a physical book for the kids to to see. So my book was the first one. And I did this out like it was a parting gift for me because the kids I was serving, it was at the mural workshop. And these kids were coming in and out of the agency that they were at. They were homeless. Mm -hmm. So they they would probably be there for a month's top and then they would transition out. But... In my mind, I'm like, I need something that they can carry on for the rest of their lives or, you know, for at least five years or whatever. So I made a book, an activity book with my face in it, you know, on every page, you know, I'm telling a lesson. So that was the first book that, you know, I produced with uh, with uh, Create Now. And that was a big furthers thing. And but from there, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if you saw the pictures earlier. You know, we're sitting there making puppets with the kids. Um, I do a lot of puppet stuff with big footers. My first show. Uh, that ever got picked up by a studio was called a uh, ratchet Rachel. Mm-hmm. And of course it's like, you know, like a Rick and Morty style adult humored content, but you know, kids still love it. Uh, and I made puppets. So with that, you know, during our Christmas parties and other parties, I would sit there and teach the kids what I know, you right. know, making puppets. Um, also with me working in animation, I've worked with all the biggest studios you can think of. You know, I worked, I, I, I used to come over here to uh, Warner brothers, um, consumer products all the time working with them. Uh, and I, I tell the kids, like, hey, this is my journey. This is what I've done. So with Big Fritters, yeah, there was a lot of times of me failing. Uh, but I do bring a lot of stuff from Big Fritters over to create now. Right. Uh, my animation background, my art background, my writing, directing, all that stuff. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, it, actually, part of the course that I taught, you guys create now again back to giving them exposure and giving them access to something they might not normally have mm-hmm. uh you guys had gotten lee eisenberg mm-hmm. who was one of the main writers for the office mm-hmm. a success hit show and got him to val- volunteer his time and, and speak to these students so yeah. you know again another example of how you guys work very hard to create an experience that is impactful mm-hmm. that makes these kids feel seen mm-hmm. feel valued and heard what is your continued vision? You know, I know you speak of the challenges, but I, I, I know I, I have no doubt you'll continue to mm-hmm. press forward and take it. But, you know, do you have as far as the vision that you're now casting for the organization? It's a little bit of yours and it's a little bit of Jill's. But paint me a picture of what Create Now looks like in, in the near future. Yeah. Um, well, within the next 25 years, hopefully Create Now can sp- spread more than just in in LA 
Right. You know, now, you know, now that we've gone through this whole pandemic, I know we were talking about the nastiness of the pandemic, but it's also taught us like, hey, we can be virtual with this thing. Right. You know, we, we can connect with people all over the world. So just just adding technology to what we're doing and seeing how far we can spread it. We can have, you know, Lee Eisenberg teach a class to kids that aren't in L.A. Right. You know, in Texas, uh, Africa, wherever. Right. Um, so that's that's one vision that that, you know, I want to bring is just expansion, not just here in L.A. because there's kids struggling all over the world, um, you know, going through certain things that they shouldn't be going through and also trying to understand the arts. Right. So if we can if we can connect people all over, then that would be great. Uh, another one of Jill's visions was she wanted to build a bigger base for us, like a center. Mm. So I know that I was in the talks uh, for a while with her and that's a big one. But hopefully we can do that in the future, too. Wow. So we have a lot of stuff going on. That's amazing. And I and I definitely have no doubt it. I know that the process is difficult, but, you know, like you just said, you're learning mm-hmm. and you're growing. I, and I feel the same thing. It's funny, even with the podcast, the, the, the social good show that we host here, when we first started, it was like, no, the, the guests have to be in studio. Right. Mm-hmm. And then when the pandemic hit, it was like, OK, well, <laughs> some of them didn't want to come in. Some of them couldn't. But it, it like you said, it's the it you end up when you pivot. Mm-hmm. There is that pivot where you learn and you grow and you realize, oh, wait, this could be a good thing. Yeah. To your point, when we when I when I do talk about the pandemic, we know that there's negative, but we also know that for a bad that a good doesn't come, you know, or can't come. Mm-hmm. So for you right now, there's obviously like I mean, aside from that, which you've shared already, I mean, we know that there's the 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 thorns and the roses. Um, but for now, yeah, as we wrap up, like what is your biggest thorn? Let's start with the thorn first. What's the thorn for you? Hmm. That's a good one. I don't think I have that many thorns in me. Um, learning, you know, just just sitting sitting down and really like just understanding what's in front of me right now. Right. Um, there's a lot of admin work that I still don't get. I'm not gonna lie. Um, just understanding how to tackle that. With Big Footers, when I started, it's the same process with Create Now. Just with Create Now, it's a nonprofit that operates in a different capacity. Um, so understanding that different capacity right now is it, all I really need to do. But other than that, I'm confident in myself to, to get things rolling, get things rocking. Um, so there's not that many thorns uh, because I know how great Create Now is. Uh, I mean, for example, we had Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, come and teach a, a, a class with our, t- our kids. That's right. That's so, right. I mean, just, just imagine, like, in my head, like, I understand how big it can be. And also in the kids' head, like, hey, you know, I, I'm a kid living down here in this area, but I'm, I'm over here hanging out with Tim Cook. Right. So, you know. So is that the rose? That's the, that's the beautiful that's the bloomed rose. rose. <laughs> the that's big bouquet. Gr- mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, you know, I really appreciate you coming on. Although, you know, my condolences again. I know it's hard. Um, but it, she trusted you too. Mm-hmm. She had so much faith in you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in in everything that we're going through and just the process of being, I think it's really incredible what you've done and how the kids um, are fortunate to have somebody who relates like you do Mm -hmm. and is as passionate. So I do hope you continue. You don't give up and I know you won't. You keep keep it going. Yeah, we don't give up, right? (laughs) We don't don't give give up up around here. (laughs) (laughs) If you, for those kids out there in the world though, that are struggling right now and, and, and are looking for ways to improve their mental health, you know, um, what are a couple of the suggestions that you have for them personally? I mean, for, first off, saying that you do need to help is the, the biggest thing because uh, a lot of us don't understand that we need help. But saying like, hey, something doesn't feel right, saying that first and then from there seeking, you know, counselor or mentor, somebody that can really guide you. Um, I think that's the next step for sure. Um, but we, we deal with mental health all differently. Uh, like myself, you know, art was the mental health healer for myself on top of therapy. But if a kid can, can find something that is an outlet from them, it could be sports, music, um, whatever, if I do that. But, un, but admitting, admitting, admit it first. Right. Admit right. it first. I can't even speak. Admit, <laughs> admit it first. And then from there, uh, you know, it, it will open the gates to heal. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. And never underestimate your power. You never know? underestimate. Never underestimate your power. Well, thank you so much for coming and being here. Thank you for I look inviting forward me. and we're going to continue to celebrate Create Now Let's and the legacy it. and the new cha- changes and, and, and triumphs coming. So Sounds good. Growth. <laughs> well, thank you so much for <laughs> being mm-hmm. here. We'll see you again. Okay. And that's another episode of Unsugarcoated with Alia. We really appreciate you. I hope that you've gotten some amazing value. I also want to add, don't forget, you can support us. We are a 501c3 production company. You can get your Unsugarcoated Live Empowered sweater. You can also go to Unsugarcoated Media itself on YouTube. Check out our social good shorts, The Unseen Fight. You're going to see it starts with the spark. And you can support us by watching our content or picking up your own hoodie and and helping us continue what we do as well. So thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you next time. And thank you for letting us be unsugarcoated. Take care.